Dr. Daniel Kissel, and he's an associate professor here at Lewis in the Department of Chemistry, and he teaches undergraduate and graduate courses. He completed his PhD in inorganic at Loyola University in 2014, where he studied ligand design and metal coordination chemistry. So you can see from his title, that's what he did. Up upon arriving at Lewis, he, he began using his background in ligand design and coordination chemistry to study metal organic frameworks. So you may hear Dr. Kissel talking a lot about moss today. In addition, Dr. Kissel also works collaboratively on projects involving enzyme mobilization on MOS, uh, copper chelate complexes for potential Alzheimer's disease therapeutics. And I will let him take it away. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Stone. And move this. Um, yeah, as Dr. Stone said, it's really exciting to see everyone in person. It's been a while. Some of you uh, I haven't seen in a long time since the pandemic started. I gave up haircuts since then, so I promise this is actually me, not an imposter. And I'm going to tell you about some of the interesting stuff that my lab does. And uh, it's really, this is an overview talk. It's not really going to go super deep into some of the concepts. I'm just going to try to overview a lot of, a lot of different projects. Being at Lewis University, uh, we're a smaller institution, but we like to collaborate quite a bit. Um, and I think that's one of the best parts about science is really challenging yourself to learn uh, new areas of science and work with new people and kind of step outside your box a little bit. So I've been trying to do that myself and I've gotten to some really interesting projects as a result. Uh, so I'm going to start by talking about ligand design. That's my background. I was trained as an inorganic chemist, but that really doesn't mean much because there are so many different types of inorganic chemists. Uh, specifically, I looked at coordination chemistry and ligand design. And ligand design is an area of, of science where uh, you're taking an organic substance or anything that really binds to a metal is considered a ligand, and we're trying to pre-organize it. And this man up here on the right, Donald J. Cram, he was the person who coined this term. Uh, he won a Nobel Prize, I think, in 1987. He was a professor at UCLA, and he's considered one of the fathers of guest host chemistries. And he said, a ligand is more pre-organized when it is more constrained to be in a conformation required to complex a metal ion. Right? So the idea of ligand design is, how can I adjust this ligand? Right? What tools can I use to achieve a specific function around metal coordination? And uh, just to give you an idea here, coordination chemistry, one of the classic coordination compounds that you hear about a lot is EDTA. It's used as a, as a preservative. Um, EDTA is this big claw-like looking thing. On, that's our ligand, right? And it's wrapping around this M here. That's a metal ion substance, right? So EDTA um, binds really tightly to metals. It's known for being a strong chelator, a, a strong coordinator. Uh, so this background of ligand design really influences the research we do. That's kind of what I lean on. And as I mentioned before, I've, I've tried to get outside my comfort zone a little bit and work with other people and, and look at how I can use my background uh, in collaboration, right, in research. And so the Kissel Lab in particular, we kind of have two main areas where we deal with um, coordination chemistry in terms of material science. Uh, and we specifically look at some, these things called metal organic frameworks, which are kind of like uh, inorganic polymers, right? They're kind of like polymers to inorganic chemists. And we look at them for uh, mostly catalysis, but also adsorption. Uh, and then we also have a, uh, a project going with Dr. Haven's group on chelation therapies for Alzheimer's disease. Right? And this is where we're really looking at small molecule coordination and how we can influence Alzheimer's disease. So on this journey today, I'm going to start here. And then I'm going to hope to take us all the way around the things that we do here in the Kissel Lab. We'll see if we have enough time. Um, but just to give you a little bit of background with Alzheimer's disease, everyone probably knows someone affected with, by Alzheimer's disease. Raise your hand if you've been affected by Alzheimer's disease or known someone. All right? There's a lot of people. Um, and I think that you're going to see this a lot more as we go forward and as our um, baby boomers start to age more and more. There's going to be more Alzheimer's disease out there. Currently, we've had 2,173 clinical trials. Um, and there's been one therapeutic treatment, one that's been FDA approved. And that was just recently, and it was extremely controversial <laughs> because none of the scientists said to approve it that were on the panel. One said, I'd like more data. <laughs> and the FDA said, okay, that's good enough. Uh, so 
There are some issues with this treatment because it has some severe side effects, uh, which was causing um, a lot of the scientists on the panel to back off of it. And one thing that might stick out to you is look at all the colors in this wheel, right? If we just look at it simply, there's a lot of colors there. Each color represents a different hypothesis for this disease and how it occurs. So what that should tell you immediately is you say, oh, there's 2,173 clinical trials. One's kind of approved, but it's controversial. And we have several different theories this is based on. So people really don't understand this disease super well at this point. And a lot of the attention has been paid to the amyloid hypothesis which is based on amyloid plaque formation. And uh, this theory has just recently been considered debunked, which ruined a lot of people's careers, which uh, you spend 30 years working on a theory. It kind of stinks that when Eli Lilly makes a drug that can take away amyloid plaques and it fails in clinical trials, right? So uh, Eli Lilly, after spending millions and millions of dollars, um, had their amyloid drug fail, uh, which was not good for them. So when I talked to Dr. Havens, we were talking about, um, you know, the biology of it, which I don't understand as well, but um, I thought more about the chemistry of what's going on and why these plaques form, right? And so these amyloid plaques kind of show up in, in different ways here. Um, and you'll see the, this is an image of a plaque formation, and they result from aggregation of the amyloid beta peptide. And so if you think back to the plaques and how they form, um, really what's happening is that this amyloid beta peptide gets oxidized and it starts to form aggregates. So in Alzheimer's patients, they see um, these large aggregates form that are mostly oxidized amyloid beta fragments, and they see large concentrations of metal, specifically copper has been really linked to it quite a bit. So when we looked at the literature, we found that copper uh, will bind in the active site of amyloid beta peptide, and when that happens, you can form a redox active species, right? So there are these two components that can interconvert. Uh, and component two over here on the right is pretty stable, but component one is, is not stable, it's not redox stable. And so it can form this transition state, this partial transition state, where you can actually reduce copper two to copper one, and you don't want copper one hanging around in your brain because it's very reactive, and it can decay according to some Fitton and Haber-Weiss processes um, to create superoxide radicals and the hydroxyl radical. And whenever you have a hydroxyl radical around cells, it will kill the cells. So we are more interested in looking at this, um, looking at this pathway where reactive oxygen species, or ROS as we call it, uh, were important in the pathogenesis of the disease. Okay? And we thought to ourselves, well, what if we were able to uh, design a ligand right, that could come in here and it could coordinate and it could block this process from occurring, or it could be you know, what we call a redox silencer. Right? It could silence this redox activity. If we had less ROS, would we see less aggregation? Right? Would that be beneficial? So this was our plan. Uh, and we started really simple. We started by looking at small molecules because in ligand design, you want to look at a series of compounds where you're changing one little thing. Right? It's a very systematic study, and you're trying to find uh, correlations. So we looked at uh, some simple amino acids, which you're oh, not used to this laser pointer up top here. And you can see they have some different characteristics. There's a little larger binding pocket here, right? Six-membered ring versus a five-member chelate ring. Uh, here we have this phenyl group hanging off the side, so there's some sterics at work. Um, you know, how does this influence the coordination? And can we put two of these ligands on here to bind to the copper while it's in the active site or, you know, competitively bind to the copper and influence the redox chemistry? So we, I call these the, the aliphatic amine donors, right? These amino acids. And we also have this, these aromatic amine donors, which are just pyridine rings, and they're really good for coordinating copper as well. Uh, and you also see they have different characteristics, like uh, different five-membered ring versus six-membered ring versus a really bulky backbone. So this is what we were looking at. And we started by doing some assays where we tried to see how the coordination chemistry would influence the production of ROS. So we did a hydrogen peroxide assay um, where we would look at the relative fluorescence. All right, so essentially uh, what we're doing is we're oxidizing this molecule, and when you do that, you get a fluorescent signal. So if you track this over time, we would use the 1 through 16 strand of amyloid beta peptide AB116, uh, which contains the active site for copper. And uh, we would put copper in there and see what happens. We just put the peptide in there and see what happens. And we'd also put ligands in there with copper, and we would look at how it affected the fluorescence. 
And what we saw was that we got this really strong re response when copper was added. So this increase in fluorescence over time, time, time and hours there, that's indicating that there's a lot of reactive oxygen species being present in solution. All right, so this is an in vitro type of method assay. Uh, and then if we have something like uh, beta alanine or glycine, we actually limit the ROS production. So we have these uh, aliphatic amine donors, which are binding to the metal, not quite as strongly, but it's definitely decreasing ROS. And then when you look at our aromatic nitrogen donors, um, it totally knocks out the ROS, right? Which is really good to see. And then we'd also incubate these in the presence of AB42, the peptide, uh, and we'd look at um, running a gel electrophoresis to figure out the amount of aggregation, right? So when we look at aggregation, we can break it down to percent monomers, trimers, tetramers, ligamers. And this is something our collaborator, uh, Dr. Havens, does in her lab. Uh, and Rachel Lulo did a lot of work on this. I should mention that. And also Emma, who is in the audience today. And we found that we got a significantly more, uh, statistically more significant amount of aggregation with a lot of these amino acids uh, compared with our aromatic nitrogen donors. So we saw that the ligands that were really suppressing the ROS the most also resulted in less aggregation, right? And there's a lot of controversy about these aggregates. A lot of people thought they were bad. And if you had more aggregates, that was causing the cell toxicity, the neurotoxicity. Uh, when we developed drugs that would eat the aggregates away, there was still neurotoxicity. So now we know that's not the case. Some people think that they're actually um, protective. They're neuroprotective. And when you start having more ROS in your brain, they'll start to show up to kind of react that away. Um, so this was an interesting result. And the other thing we wanted to look at uh, we were really interested in uh, the electrochemistry, right? So we wanted to study the relative electrochemistry of these complexes in solution to see if we could understand uh, or, or at least find a little bit of a correlation between how um, the coordination chemistry influenced the electrochemistry and what we were seeing with this ROS production and aggregate formation. So we would look at the two to one complexes at millimolar concentration and you could see all of those complexes here, and we've basically we've separated it to our amino acids over here, and the green line's copper. And you'll notice that those amino acids all look very much the same. They all look like free copper in solution. And that's because they're not really very strong coordinate, coordinators, right? They don't coordinate the, the metal very well, very strongly. So the complex in solution isn't nearly as stable. Um, we see that we get uh, a two electron way, or a, whoops one sequential electron waves. Sorry about that, there we go. So right, here's, here's our reduction for copper two to copper one, and then copper one to zero, and then we oxidize it back, right? So we get these sequential one electron waves present in our cyclic voltammograms. Um, but over here when we have the aromatic donors, our uh, pyridine lig ligand groups, we only get one electron waves, okay? So there's some features that are really important here. Um, first of all, uh, we only get the one electron wave here, so we're not really seeing that next reduction um, from co of copper one. The other thing is that the potentials, the uh, apparent potentials there, the apparent redox potentials, are shifted dramatically, right, uh, to more negative, right, which is, a, which is an important factor for um, the ability of copper two to be reduced to copper one. So we see these shifts in the apparent redox potentials. We also see that there are different peak currents, right, so there's not as much the peak current is much lower over here with the aromatic nitrogen donors as opposed to over here when we have these amino acids. Um, so if you think about the coordination chemistry, these coordinate copper really strongly and they're really influencing the electrochemistry of copper in solution. All right, so this makes sense. Uh, these don't coordinate copper as strongly and as a matter of fact, this really sharp stripping wave we see here, that's a clear indication of poisoning at the electrode. Uh, because copper one will like to do this thing called agglomeration in solution, or, or, and where it'll basically form copper two and copper zero, and then it'll start to stick on your electrode surface and it'll influence your results. All right? And so this is a, a pure sign of, of what we call copper poisoning on our electrode when you see that really sharp increase like that. Um, so this also makes sense because your copper species is less stable, right? So it's gonna be free to agglomerate when it goes in solution. But over here, we weren't seeing any of that agglomeration, right? Now, we also wanted to look at the reversibility, so we changed our scan rates. And what we noticed is that we had a quasi-reversible system. I'm just showing beta alanine here at different scan rates. Um, but all of our amino acids were very similar, and that um, 
these peaks are going to shift a little bit at different scan rates, um, and that's because you have this copper poisoning. Right? It's, not a, it's not a reversible system, so it's not going to follow a Reynolds fix uh, relationship. And actually, if you plot the uh, peak current potentials just uh, versus the scan rate, not the root of the scan rate, just the scan rate, if you get a linear relationship, that is an indication that you have poisoning of your electrode. Right? So we were seeing that for all of our uh, aliphatic amine donors. And for our aromatic donors, uh, we saw that they actually, for at least BIPI and DPA, we got a, a reversible system. So here's DPA, and you can see it's electrochemically reversible. Our peak currents are lining up the same spot there. And when we plot the peak current potential versus square, square, square root of the scan rate, we get a good linear relationship with like a 0.99 or 0.98 correlation there. So this made sense to us. The one thing we noticed is that um, our 110 phenanthrolene was not reversible. It was quasi-reversible. Um, but it, it was not uh, suffering from the copper poisoning because it's hard to see on this graph, but this uh, relationship, the R squared value, is, is not linear. You can't really see it well because of the uh, aliphatic amine donors. So that tells us that uh, we're getting a really strong coordinator from that 110 fin, but we're not getting reversible behavior. All right, so we did this really long in vitro investigation, but we wanted to study our ligands in vivo. So we decided to look at a worm model, a nematode model, uh, and we use these things called C. elegans. All right, and so this is where uh, Dr. Havens has done a considerable amount of work with her group uh, because I cannot work with these things to save my life. As a matter of fact, it's well known that I'm not allowed in the worm lab because I will kill the worms, right? So you can see them moving around here on a microscope, and this is 30 times magnification. And so our students have to tend to these, and it's a daily, daily routine where they have to move them every day. Um, they're on plates with food, and then we put different things in their food, right? So we could put copper in their food. Uh, we can put uh, ligands in their food with copper, right? Whatever we want, and they'll, they'll eat it, and it should ingest it, or they'll, um, and so they'll take it up into their body. Now these worms, are genetically modified to express the human amyloid beta 1 through 42 fragment. All right, so we get these from the University of Minnesota. We have a control group, um, and we also have our AD worms. And we put them on our plate, and we do mobility assays, and we look at how much they're moving that day. So we track them over several days to see how their mobility changes. And we kind of use this scoring where A is mobile without stimulus, B is mobile after a touch stimulus, C is only the head's mobile, and then D is they're paralyzed, or they're, at that point they're dead or paralyzed, right? So that's kind of what we look at. Um, and we started investigating these and developing a second generation of ligands as well. So um, our first generation of ligands that we looked at were really simple. And then we started getting to our in vivo model and developing a second generation of ligands where we saw that these aromatic nitrogen donors were very important. Uh, to the reducing ROS. And we also wanted to see if we could have a hydroxyl scavenger in there, so we added some sulfur bridges. So we could pro potentially do redox silencing as well as hydroxyl scavenging in these systems. And we see that they give dramatically different CV results, right? So now um, you can see that these apparent potentials are way further apart, uh, almost uh, irreversible behavior. And what we see when we add these different systems, so here's kind of our results from the worms. Um, we noticed that beta alanine and copper really improved worm life for AD worms. Um, and I, we don't have that. These are, these are AD worms right here. Right? We noticed that copper start, sort of uh, made them die off a little more. And we also noticed that one of our new ligands, which is one TPIQ here, um, really killed the worms pretty quickly. <laughs> so so the, the, the issue we're having here is probably a toxicity issue where we're over the LD50 limit. Because uh, we look at toxicity in neurons, but with our worm plates, we have to have a really high concentration in order for the worms to uptake them. And uh, I think we're just over our concentration limit. So you can see just with the ligand by itself and the ligand with copper, our worms are dying off considerably uh, much faster. But if we look at a, a structural isomer, which is our TPQ here, and these are all synthesized by Eric Sanchez in our lab, you can see that this does just fine, right? So it's amazing how our sulfur, um, you know, we have just a slightly different connectivity 
uh, between our TPQ and our TPIQ, and we get very different results in terms of their toxicities. All right, so this is kind of where we're at with this project, and, and uh, right now we're moving on forward, doing more work with our worms, studying our second generation of ligands as well to get more results. Um, we've had some interesting results with copper and beta alanine that we're also exploring. They seem to create superworms almost. Uh, so now I'm going to transition our focus. We've been talking about coordination chemistry in small molecules. Now I want to think about coordination chemistry and materials, right? Extended structures, um, polymers, if you will. All right. So uh, if we use coordination chemistry, we have a specific ligand, a planar ligand and it coordinates our metal ion in a specific manner, we can get an extended structure, right? Where our metal coordinates to one side of the ligand, which then coordinates to another metal, right? So you're almost bridging between two metal nodes. And this can continue on um, and to create this extended framework. And so what you're seeing in this video is a look down at one of these frameworks known as a metal organic framework, where you see these copper nodes here, and the organic portion, the ligand, are these black spheres, right, which is carbon. And so you can see that's what we call the paddle wheel, where it's extending out all over. And it's creating this network that is very porous, which is why I'm interested in them. Um, so you can have guest host relationships, guest host interactions. It's also got a ton of surface area, right? It's kind of like a napkin, where uh, if you unfold a napkin, you realize there's a lot of surface area there, right? Metal organic framework has a ton of surface area. It's just folded up into a very small volume. Um, and because there's an inorganic component, it's really structured, but the organic component gives you tunability. So, you know, they have a high degree of flex of versatility uh, plus ordered structure that gives you a very rational design. So we explore this material quite a bit in my lab. Um, and so this kind of gives you a look at how you would make these. When we, when we synthesize these, we do a solvable thermal reaction uh, where we kind of seal them up in a bomb here. Um, and we add the inorganic component, the metal. We add an organic ligand. And then you form this complex, which is known as the secondary building unit. That secondary building unit then goes on to extend into this really large structure. And they're pretty easy to work with if you have the right conditions. Right? You can form them pretty easily in the lab. A lot of my undergraduates do it, uh, most, most of them successfully, right? <laughs> and so uh, you get this porous nature, you get your structured inorganic component, and your versatile organic component. We're going to really focus on that uh, versatility here in the next part. So our group really explores MOF polymer interactions, um, this area called polymer MOF hybrid composites. And, uh, you know, metal organic frameworks are. Um, great, but they're kind of difficult to get into materials, right? So this area of polymer MOF composites really takes a look at taking an inorganic polymer like a MOF and embedding it into an organic polymer to make a material. And there are several different ways you can do this. You could take the MOF and embed it within the organic polymer. You could take organic polymer and embed it within the MOF. <laughs> you could take the MOF and decorate it on a particle. Um, you could make just a composite material. And you can also uh, create nanofibers or organic polymers that come off of the metal organic framework. Now the first one that we kind of looked at in our lab was this one right there, right? Where we take a metal organic framework and we entrap it into a polymer. That's what we wanted to start with to see if we could actually make these materials. And this was done by my first graduate student, Tom. Um, and so we took cellulose acetate, which is the most abundant biopolymer available. And if you take, um, cellulose acetate, right? You just take your monomer and you mix it with some synthesized metal organic framework, which is, this is a copper metal organic framework, MOF 199. We make a slurry out of it um, with DMAC, dimethyl acetamide, and we drop it into water. And that would force the polymerization to occur before the MOF could escape. And you'd almost trap the MOF into this cellulose, uh, cellulose polymer that you'd create. And so you can see here's just cellulose by itself when it polymerizes. And then here's the cellulose MOF199 composite bees. You see that nice blue structure right there for them. And um, you know, this is, these are images where we're zoomed in quite a bit. So these are uh, scanning electron microscopy images. Uh, and then we also have an AFM image courtesy of Dr. Kelleher in his lab. And so you can kind of see this is zoomed out. So that's 200 microns right there. 
And these metal organic frameworks, especially HCUST1, form really large aggregates uh, of solid powder. And you can see that if you zoom in to 10 microns, you can really see that MOF formation right there. And this is our cellulose acetate. So cellulose acetate, you know, it's kind of got these nanopores and these mesopores bumps. And if you look in there, you can see the cellulose acetate just kind of around that metal organic framework and trapping it in there. And so that was our first uh, successful attempt at this moth polymer hybrid composite. And we decided to use these for dye adsorption, looking at absorbing pollutants and absorbent material. Uh, and we just used methylene blue as a model dye. And essentially, you mix methylene blue in there with the moth. And because it's got so much surface area, it'll just soak the dye up. Now, the nice thing about this metal organic framework, HCUST1, is it's antimicrobial. So we saw that there is a, a strong antimicrobial behavior. Right? If we looked at the optical density of uh, E. coli broth, this resisted growth quite a bit more, um, whereas our, our just cellulose acetate and our control were going off the charts. Um, and one of the problems with metal organic frameworks is that you have a, a coordination bond uh, between the metal and the ligand. If that's not strong, it's not going to hold really well. And so when it goes into water, it starts to break apart. Right? And so we noticed that um, when you took this mop and put it in water, you would get a ton of leaching out into the solution right, right away, almost after two hours. But by trapping it in this polymer, um, we were protecting it even more. And actually, we went on and did some post-synthetic modifications uh, where we would reduce the moth in situ and we would create copper oxide particles, which were really good adsorbents, and we wouldn't have to worry about them leaching as much. So this was kind of our first venture into this area. Uh, since then, we started working on covalent attachments. So I'm going to talk to you about another project that my student Jordan Shanahan started, um, where we really looked at the difference between entrapping um, the moth into a polymer versus covalently linking it to the polymer. All right, so this is the next area that we're going to look at down here. Uh, and this project was motivated by energy. So this is a very busy slide, um, but I'm going to walk you through it really quickly here. Um, you know, you have an energy crisis right now in your world, and it's going to be here for a while, and you're going to have to deal with it, right? And so there's a lot of people doing research in this area. Uh, companies like Cummins is very interested in alternative energies. They're interested in lithium ion. They're also interested quite a bit in hydrogen. And the reason why companies like Cummins and Toyota and Kenworth are interested in hydrogen fuel cell technology is because of this energy density right here, right? Lithium ion batteries only deliver a certain amount of energy. And when you look at the energy per weight, they're very inefficient, especially compared with gasoline, right? And hydrogen. Hydrogen is our mo most efficient energy source in terms of energy density. So um, places that do uh, large trucking operations like Kenworth, um, they partner with Toyota to make hydrogen fuel cell trucks because they can go three times longer using hydrogen fuel cells than they can on lithium ion batteries. You just can't stack enough cells into a truck and the weight starts to work against you. Right? So that's a problem that engineers are confronted with. Now, as chemists, when you think about hydrogen, you think, oh, this is great because in a hydrogen fuel cell, we combine hydrogen with oxygen that flows through the air and uh, the byproduct is just water. Right? So very clean, no carbon emissions. Uh, the problem is most of the um, hydrogen we get is from this process called steam methane reforming. And if you look at the steam methane reforming reaction, it's a water gas ship catalyzed reaction, one of the products there is CO2. So that's where the majority of hydrogen currently comes from uh, in our world. Now the other thing we can do is water electrolysis. A lot of people like hydrogenics in Canada, they're very interested in water electrolysis where we're doing the opposite of the reaction that's done in the fuel cell. But this requires energy, right? We know that water doesn't spontaneously separate into hydrogen and oxygen. Otherwise, when we go to a pond and try to fish, that would be a major problem for us, right? So it doesn't want to do this. You have to supply energy. And so whenever you're on a, a, using an electrolyzer, you got to plug it in. Where are you plugging it into, right? Where are you going on the grid? Most of the time, you're going to a coal plant, right? So you might be going to a coal plant, you might be going to a plant that has natural gas. That doesn't help our carbon process. So a lot of people are looking at uh, connecting solar with water electrolysis and different systems to kind of create this closed loop where 
we make hydrogen from water, and then we take that hydrogen and we use it in a fuel cell and bring our water back. And there are two systems that are probably going to um, be the most valuable here. That's a photoelectrochemical cell, PEC cell, and a Z-scheme particle suspension reactor. So these are the two systems that are working. And for both of these systems to work, you have to catalyze this process. So we need a material that's going to absorb energy from the sun and use that energy to catalyze this reaction, supply what we need to split water. Right? And so we thought about this and we said, well, why not a moth? Right? If you really look at the material you need, all right, there are four things that matter. Right? For catalysis, surface area matters. We know moths have surface area. Um, but for this type of catalysis, band gap matters. The ideal band gap you want is about 1.9 electron volts because you get ohmic losses. Right? And when you do this in acidic solution, really you can separate these half reactions. And you see when light hits, you get a separation between an electron and hole. Okay? And so if light comes in and hits our material, that hole that gets created comes up and reacts with the water. So this is a hole driven process. And we split water into oxygen and hydronium and four electrons. The electrons leave the anode and go to the cathode where they reduce hydronium to hydrogen. Right? So really this is the process we're interested in is that OER reaction. Uh, and when we think about a catalyst, we also need to consider stability, chemical stability, thermodynamic stability, and cost. So we, and then, okay, here's our electron going in to do the reduction. So we looked at zirconium MOFs for this. This zirconium MOF is a UIO 66, um, and it is the most stable MOF that's known, right? So in terms of its stability, it's one of the best you can get out there. It's water stable, uh, it has high thermal stability. It'll work well in this system because not all MOFs are water stable. And we really wanted to look at two different types, right? Uh, UIO66 and UIO66 NH2, and they vary by uh, just one group, this NH2 group off the linker right there. So this is our organic linker that bridges our zirconium oxide clusters, and there's just a difference there in that NH2 group, okay? And you'll see why in a second. Uh, so the first thing we did is look at surface area. So just to give you an idea of how this compares to traditional like metal oxide uh, particles, um, you know, here's our XRD that shows we've made these MOFs. So you get this nice uh, octahedron crystal. Uh, and then we can do the surface area, the BET surface area, with the nitrogen absorption and our surface area analyzer. And, um, you know, just to give you an idea, the UIO66 is in blue here, and the NH2 is a little less. But we get surface areas of, uh, on the order of 1,200 meters squared per gram. If you compare that to a standard TiO2 particle, uh, that's 190 nanometers in size, it's significantly more. All right? So we're hoping this surface area effect helps with the catalysis. Um, now, one problem with using MOFs like this, you have a large metal oxide cluster that's insulating. And if you want charge to be carried through your system, uh, it's not good to have an insulating material there. So our big idea, uh, most, most people will you know, couple these to uh, conductive glass, but our big idea was to use a polymer, a conductive polymer. So we wanted to see if we could efficiently move uh, our charges using uh, a polyaniline, right? And we would make the emeraldine green form using chloride. And, you know, if we do this, in theory, we should be able to use the pi stacking effect to transfer our electron uh, in this process. So we needed to add conductivity somehow. All right, now when you make polyaniline, you take aniline, and you use a strong oxidant and you mix it together, right? And if you want to, uh, and you need the HCl in there to provide the chloride. So uh, we tried to do this with our metal organic framework as well. And that's the reason we looked at UIO66 versus UIO66 NH2, right? Um, we thought that this NH2 group uh, might be a better match for our UIO66 NH2, and we can actually get covalent linkage off of our metal organic framework. So we looked at both, and uh, we would make our MOF and mix it with aniline and APS and over a 24-hour period with shaking. Um, these are different ratios of aniline, and you can see that panties start to form in solution. And we also did this with UIO66 and H2, um, where, and we were expecting to see a little bit of a difference here, this showing a covalent attachment to that linker uh, versus just some 
uh, uh, non-covalent interactions, kind of holding that MOF into the polymer composite. And so we did a series of uh, analysis with these. This is SEM imaging. And you can already see a pretty distinct difference. The top three images here are for UIO66 that doesn't have that amine group. And it's at different ratios of PANI, right? So as we increase the amount of aniline, we get a stronger PANI network. Uh, but we get these really large shards. And, and it doesn't quite look as uniform as down here. This is UIO66 and H2. And when we go from our 1 to 1 to our 3 to 1, we see that these, um, you know, these really light areas, those are the metal organic frameworks, right? Because zirconium has a hard, high atomic number. So you can see the MOF looks like it's, it's fine, it's retained here, but something else is going on here. And if you really zoom in on that three to one, you can see that those panty nanofibers forming off the metal organic framework, which is a really neat, neat picture. Um, so we wanted to see how this influenced the conductivity. The MOF is insulating. And we found that by using um, polyanilin, right, here's our, here's our conductivity, which is measured from sheet resistivity using a four-point probe. Uh, we can see that polyanilin's like, you know, uh, conducting quite a bit more. It's semiconducting technically. Uh, the blue bar was for our UIO66 without the NH2 group. The orange bar is for UIO66 with the NH2 group. So when we just have a one-to-one -one ratio of aniline to MOF, we don't get uh, uh, much of a difference in, in the conductivity, but as you increase the ratio of aniline to MOF, you start to get into that semiconducting nature right here, which is really good. Um, but we get a lot more with PANI UIO66 than we do with the NH2 group, okay? And then when we looked at the band gaps, we saw that the band gaps were um, all relatively within the region we wanted. Uh, we would use integrating sphere uh, attachment into our spectrometer. Uh, and we would calculate the band gaps using a talc plot, assuming a direct transition. Uh, and we found that our band gaps were a little bit higher than we wanted, but they all fell within reason uh, so that we could have a photoactive material, right? Now, one thing we did notice when we did the IR characterization, here you're going to see the metal organic framework, the IR for that. And those carboxylate stretches are really important, right? That kind of indicates that your MOF is still intact. Um, so if you'll notice here for UIO66, it looks like they start to separate as we add more and more aniline. But for UIO66 and H2, those carboxylate peaks stay there. All right? So this is, is really interesting finding. And when we looked at the surface area, we also noticed a huge difference. Um, the the UIO66 and H2, we would got a moderate drop in surface area, which you would expect because those fibers are blocking the pores. Um, but it was not uh, outside of reason. Our theoretical MOF content matched up with the apparent MOF content from our calculation. And when we added even more aniline, we got a, a larger drop, but we still had good surface area. Now, when you don't have that NH2 group on the linker, you just have UIO66, you get huge drops in surface area, right? Which is a clear indication that you have a breakdown in the MOF. And when we looked at the XRD results here, that's exactly what we saw, right? So we did XRD TGA. Uh, basically, we're looking at the crystallinity of the MOF and if it's intact. Um, here's one to one UIO66, where these peaks are all from the MOF. When we increase to three to one, you'll notice we get these really large bumps, right? Because we have the amorphous uh, polyaniline going in there. But then there's this sharp peak right here, and we lose a lot of the MOF peaks. So whenever we have just UIO66 without the NH2 group on the linker, we start to decompose the MOF into uh, a polymorph of zirconium oxide. And that phases right at the same 2 theta angle. And you can also see this in the TGA, where it's basically we heat this a very controlled fashion to see when it decomposes. And we get a sharp drop off in that 3 to 1 poly polyaniline to MOF because of this breakdown. right? Now, if we look at the UIO66, we can see we have all these MOF peaks in the 1 to 1 and the 3 to 1. And we're seeing these amorphous peaks there from the organic polymer. So that's a good sign that there's a good bonding synergy between the MOF and the organic polymer. All right? But this wasn't photoactive when we tested it. All right? We wanted to make this photoactive material. We increased the, the conductivity so it was semiconducting. And it didn't happen, 
Okay. So whenever you have a problem in the lab, you start to go back and think about why it didn't happen. And it started to make sense to us. If you think about the transition that's going on there in the moth, right, if it's on the panty, right, that's because that's you get a lot of panty and the absorption band there from the uh, plasmon shift resonance. Uh, but if you think about the, the polyaniline or the moth, the linker, this is a pi to pi star transition that's going on, right? And that's what, that's what creates those bands. That is not long lived, at least not long enough to do any kind of catalysis. So when we went back and looked at the literature, we found a nice computational paper that said, hey, if you use a lanthanide that has an F orbital at the right energy, you can induce a ligand and metal charge transfer, and now the hole that you create when the electron separates hangs around longer, and you can do catalysis. So we started looking into these um, post-synthetic modifications uh, where we would do an exchange. We take cerium, and we do a post-synthetic metal exchange where it's just substituted for a zirconium in the metal cluster. Uh, we'd also graft it where it just kind of stick on to the, to the moth somewhere. And you could do secondary coordination, but we didn't explore this as much. And the hope was that we would get uh, a lower band gap and we would also get this ligand to metal charge transfer. And so when we look at doing this cerium substitution just with the moth, um, sure enough, we get cerium in there by EDS. Uh, our surface area is still pretty high. It doesn't change much. And we see that we get indication of a ligand to metal charge transfer, right? We're extending uh, that absorption band. And when you calculate the band gap, it goes down to 1.86, which is perfect. That's right where we want to be for this process, okay? So now we had to look at um, the photocatalysis, and we just used rhodamine B dye. So we take rhodamine B dye solution, uh, we look at where it absorbs, right? And we would take a, a 300 watt xenon lamp and we'd shine it onto our solution with the moth present. So this is a heterogeneous solution. You have particles in there and you have the dye solution. Um, and then we would monitor, we'd track the absorption band of rhodamine B over time. Okay. So uh, what happens in these metal organic frameworks, is, as we talked about when we started, is they will absorb dyes, right? Remember when we started this venture, we looked at methylene blue, and we just would throw them off in there and dye would come into the moth. That happens here as well with rhodamine B. So when you run this experiment, you have to give it time to hit adsorption equilibrium. We let it absorb onto the particle until we don't see any changes in the uh, absorption band of rhodamine B. After that point, right, once we get to that equilibrium, then we turn our light on and we see if we can degrade the dye even more. And that tells us if we get um, the photocatalysis, okay? So um, this is our pure UIO66 in H2, and this is just looking, uh, looking at our, our absorption over time, and we don't see any difference with the lights on and the lights off. But when we use our UIO66 in H2, that's cerium substituted, we do see a difference between uh, when we don't have any lights on for the absorption, where you're just getting you know, pure dye absorption, versus uh, photo degradation of our dye, right? And so we see a percent dye removal of 88% over 24 hours by doing this experiment. So we are indeed getting that photo uh, effect, that photo dye degradation that we were hoping for. Okay, so I think I got time to talk about one more thing and then I'll end it. Um, and that's going to be a strategy that we looked at recently during the COVID pandemic where we're basically decorating MOF onto a particle, all right? And I can't talk too much about the synthesis of, of the particle, but I'll let you know um, kind of the result because I think it's a cool story. Um, whenever the pandemic hit, uh, someone came to us and said, hey, you know, what do you think about using ozone as a disinfectant, right? Uh, everyone was worried about PPE. Remember when the pandemic first started? There were a lot of PPE shortages. Doctors were worried. Uh, nurses were worried. Um, people didn't want to get on airplanes for a while. And we were trying to do something to help uh, sterilize PPE. That was our first initial idea. And then we thought about airplanes because we were at Lewis University and we have airplanes, right? Uh, so we started with the, working with this group called O3 Aerosystems on uh, developing a disinfection system that would use ozone to degrade SARS-CoV-2, 
right? And ozone is well known in the literature to kill most pathogens. Uh, you know, it's a very strong oxidant, so um, it's very effective at killing pathogens. Um, but because it's effective at killing pathogens, it can also be dangerous to you, right? If you look on your weather app, you'll see ozone alerts someday. Um, and these are the OSHA guidelines for ozone exposure. So just like water or anything else, right, there's a, there's a lethal limit that you cannot uh, expose yourself to, and ozone's no different there, right? The conditions matter very much. So according to uh, OSHA and the, the EPA, right, if you're at 0.1 ppm concentration, uh, you can be around it for eight hours, right? 0.2 ppm concentration, you're safe to be around it for two hours. Uh, when you look at degrading, inactivating pathogens, we found this formula in the literature here, and we found that we need to be at five milligrams of ozone per meter cubed, which is much higher than our limits here, right? So our biggest issue wasn't really treating um, viruses or pathogens, it was how can we treat it efficiently and then remove it right away, right? Because ozone is typically created by air flowing over a coronal discharge plate, uh, and then when you get that coronal discharge, you create O3, which is unstable, and over time goes back to oxygen, O2. So the beauty in this method is that you're creating a very unstable molecule. It's effective at inactivating viruses, but it's unstable. So how can we increase that degradation, right? That was really our challenge. Um, and so we developed a novel catalyst, and if you know anything about the research I've been telling you about, you could probably imagine what was on it, right? Uh, so uh, in this novel catalyst that we built, we found there are two things really important. Uh, first, airflow mattered quite a bit, which makes sense because the ozone's going around and running into things, it's gonna react more and, and it's going to degrade more. Um, so airflow is really important. If you just have ozone around with no airflow, it has a half-life of about 30 minutes, according to first order decay, right? But with our catalyst and our airflow system, we were able to get that half-life down to 30 seconds, right? So here's kind of our catalyst cycling um, over time. And here you can see the trials where we generate it. And then this is where we, uh, we basically built this contraption in the lab uh, that Chris Hooker spent a lot of time building and engineering. So I'm very grateful for him to figuring this out. Uh, but you would just, we set this up so you would push a button, you would generate ozone to a certain concentration, and then once you hit that concentration, the detector would detect it, it would flip another fan on that would run it through our catalyst, okay? And then this is the degradation from the catalyst, right? So you can see that sharp degradation time, which is really spectacular. Um, so overall, we kind of decided we wanted to create this sterilization chamber where we would generate ozone, and then we'd have a treatment time for about uh, eight, 10 minutes, and then we would degrade it. So overall, we wanted this process to go in 15 minutes or so and be really effective at killing pathogens, right? And we saw that our catalyst was very effective. So if we compare it to activated carbon, uh, we get quite a bit more degradation of ozone uh, per amount of catalyst. So we had a really good catalyst working. Um, so, uh, our chamber worked well, our chamber system worked well. Uh, we used E. coli as a model, and we were able to kill about 97% of E. coli just from this method with ozone. Um, and we also looked at doing this on an airplane, right? So one of the neat things that Chris got to do during his sure experience is he got to go out to the new MD-80, and we developed a, a much larger scale system from our lab scale system to kind of replicate the same thing where we would uh, take E. coli and, and Petri dishes and put them all over the MD-80, and we would run ozone through the MD-80 for, we wanted to get uh, up, up and down in 30 minutes for the concentration we needed, treatment time, and then back down. And we were right there in the 30 to 40 minute range in between 30 and 40 minutes. And when you look at the results, we were able to kill, you know, this is where we place the E. coli. We go low, middle, and high. And it took a while to figure out the airflow to get the treatment right, but we were really effective at killing the E. coli uh, and, and eliminating that growth, 97.3%, right? Okay, so um, I also have a project with Dr. Stone, but she's going to talk in the seminar series as well. I'll just mention it really briefly. Um, it also looks at polymers in metal organic frameworks, but enzymes, which are kind of like biology's polymers, right? So um, 
Enzymes, uh, we, we thought about attaching enzymes to MOFs, uh, kind of using some of these same strategies. And you can see these different ways we can, we can do this. And uh, Dr. Stone suggested using a bienzymatic system, which we've started doing, uh, where uh, you have two enzymes working together. Uh, and by bringing them spatially close to each other, uh, attaching them onto the metal organic framework sub substrate, you can get better catalysis and better stability. So, uh, you know, what you're looking at here um, is pyrogallo going to prepare a gallon. And we catalyze this just by putting sugar into our MOF enzyme composite. Uh, the sugar reacts with glucose oxidase to create hydrogen peroxide, which then reacts with our other enzo enzyme, horseradish peroxidase, and it does the catalysis here for us. All right, so she's going to talk more about this, I'm sure, in, in her research talk. And we started looking at other bi-enzymatic systems and doing some more advanced cross-linking with uh, carbodiimides, which you can do in water. So once again, using this NH2 version of the metal organic framework, kind of as an arm to grab onto and covalently link the enzyme. And we've had some really good results uh, in terms of increasing our enzyme activity and stability doing these methods. Uh, now we're trying to get into chlorination reactions for pharmaceuticals using um, CPO enzyme. All right, so I tried to overview everything, so I don't really have a lot of conclusions other than inorganic chemistry research is pretty awesome, and the only thing we're going to do in the future is continue to do work, All right? Because it's interesting and we like it, and when we learn more about our systems, we want to do more. Um, so I'll end by thanking uh, all the people that help out. I wouldn't be able to do this without the help from my collaborators, the support from the university, and especially, especially the students. Right? The students uh, do so much work here, and, and they really uh, make this lab go, make the Kissel lab go, and, and all the fantastic results and accomplishments we've been able to make are really because of the students, many of which are here today and you see up here on this slide. Um, so with that, I will take any questions. Is there anyone online, John, that I need to? OK. What's up, Jason? On the, the polymer functionalized, conducting polymer functionalized materials, yeah. you showed polyaniline. Is there, is there a reason you chose polyaniline one, right? And two, would it be successful? Uh, the reason we, ch we chose uh, polyanilin in particular is just because, uh, you know, we had, the anilin was here <laughs> and, and we knew how to make it well, but specifically because of the polymerization process where that amine group is vitally important. So we thought that it could polymerize off the moth with the amine group. Um, and we have looked, I, you know, I just the other day was starting to look at other conductive polymers, and I think that's really the, the area I'd like to get in. The biggest problem with, with PEC in general um, it's not so much about the production you can get, right? And this is important to consider in, in any research you get. Um, what's the cost per hydrogen that makes it a competitive um, energy solution in the market, right? So you got to get the amount of hydrogen per dollar down to where it's going to be competitive with gasoline. Otherwise, none of this matters. And, you know, I, I see this all the time when I review people who are doing solar research and they're using molecules that are just absurdly expensive. And yeah, you're going to get great efficiency, but no one's going to buy it, right? So organic, conductive organic polymers, right, much cheaper than ITO, right? Any kind, and, and so if you think about metal oxides, conductive glass, right, that, that, all that stuff increases the price. So if you can do it cheaper, it might not be doing it better, but it's really not about doing it better. It's about getting the best, uh, the most amount you can for, per cost. Other questions? If you're more interested in that, there's a guy named Shane Ardo at Cal Irvine. 
Now this really changed the way I thought about things and basically he was working with some engineers from Stanford and they did a full cost analysis of, of you know, what it would take to get this technology competitive in the market. Which is why they think the Z scheme particle reactor is the way to go where you have a photoactive anode and a photoactive cathode that um, you know, matches up well with their band gaps. So instead of having an electrode, you just have particles in a bag, basically, <laughs> out in the sun. Going yeah. off the efficiency kind of question, when you functionalized those MOF with PANI, did you ever end up putting them into an aqueous system? Yeah, yes, we did. So, so we did put them into an aqueous system. Um, I mean, that's what they, they're in when they, we do the photo degradation, because uh, the rhodamine B solution is aqueous. Uh, the problem is if you want to put them on to, you know, we wanted to put it on a glass backing to make an electrode. Um, and we would do a, a self-assisted evaporation, right, which essentially you're just taking a slurry and letting the solution evaporate. Um, that did not give us uh, good results because the panty would flake off. So uh, now what we've been looking at doing is um, uh, doing a, a layer by layer type of deposition where we clean the glass surface to be atomically smooth as best we can, and we use uh, an amino silane, and then grow the, and then we covalently, want to covalently attach the moth panty particle to the glass using the silane. And you're still gonna use chloride if you're dumping ions. Yes, but that creates issues in, in water as well, as you know. Um, but so far, we've seen that we still get photoactivity even by having it in solution. Um, so uh, if you have more chloride in there, you get more you know, better sheet conductivity for sure. But we do see, um, we have done some CV results. Actually, if you want to see Ian where, um, you know, we're looking at the ferrous cyanide and basically we put the, our solutions onto the end of the electrode. And so for whatever reason, it seems like we get, you know, we just look at the same, co same concentration, same scan rate but we're functionalizing the electrode differently. And uh, this is what Jess Newhouse did. And so you could see uh, just having panty on it, you don't get a great peak current electrode, the emerald dean form. But when we have the MOF panty, I think that's right. Oh, here's the panty. The top one here is panty with UIO66 and H2, and this is the cerium substitute. We get the best peak current potentials there. And I think there could be something with the metal organic framework uh, that's keeping the, the anion in there a little more. All right, thank you everyone. Oh, no problem. It was my pleasure. <laughs>